Good morning and welcome to NorCal Apex Accelerators webinar, SBA Mentor Protege Program Overview. My name is Amanda Anderson. I'm the Program Coordinator for NorCal Apex Accelerator. And today's presentation and fantastic guest speaker is Paul Tavernia, one of our fantastic procurement specialists on the Apex Accelerator team. Now, Paul has recently started with the Apex Accelerator team, but prior to joining, Paul has spent over 16 years working with the Small Business Administration. Most of his tenure was spent as the team lead of business opportunity specialists focused on supporting small businesses just like yours. So, before I pass it off to him for the real meat and potatoes of this presentation, I want to let everybody know a little bit about how NorCal Apex Accelerator can help you with government contracting and with mentor protege. So what is the Apex Accelerator program? Well, it's a program that is federally mandated to provide education and training to all businesses. While we do focus on small businesses, we provide training and education to anyone. And that training and education has the end goal of helping you contract with the government agencies locally, at your state level, or at a federal level. And with over 96 Apex accelerators nationwide, you can absolutely get connected with an Apex accelerator if you're not within our service area or if you're all the way across the country, there's absolutely an Apex Accelerator new, near you. Even within California, we have, what is that? Seven, seven Apex Accelerator centers that are here to help you with government contracting. And did I mention all of these resources from the one-on-one -on -one counseling to these trainings that you're currently attending are absolutely no cost. No Apex Accelerator Center should be asking for you to pay for these services. That's part of our, part of our charm. <laughs> so specifically with NorCal Apex Accelerator, we offer our government contracting assistance in three main facets. We offer one-on-one -on -one counseling, which is Primar primarily done virtually over Zoom, but we do have in-person office hours in Humboldt County. And when you sign up and become a client to get access to this one-on-one -on -one counseling, you'll be able to meet with a procurement specialist just like Paul or just like any of the other fantastic folks on our team. And they'll be able to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one to go through any hiccups or hurdles you may be having with government contracting whether that's a tricky SAM registration or maybe you're submitting your first application for this certification that you need. Or maybe you've already won a contract and now you just need to make sure you stay compliant. That's where one-on-one -on -one counseling really shines. They can get down into the dirt with you in government contracting and help you fill out these forms, help you proofread these compliance forms, help you proofread bids and solicitations. It's a fantastic service to have that, that support when you need it. And another way that our clients get government contracting assistance is our custom bid matching service. So our custom bid matching service is a software that our program actually pays for and is able to offer to our clients at absolutely no cost. Again, Apex Accelerator services are no cost to you. But what this bid matching software does is it allows you and your counselor to find out what keywords you're looking for, whether that be keywords based on your industry or keywords based on your product or your location. And they'll input that into your bid match account. And the software goes to all of the various procurement sites from the state, from the local cities and counties, even to the federal government, and it'll look for those key words that you set down, those key words that you are looking for in your opportunities. And it'll email relevant opportunities directly to your inbox. And that can take so much of the legwork and 
time that it really takes to be successful in government contracting is getting those opportunities directly in your inbox. You look at that every day. <laughs> and our third pillar of services is one you're actually taking advantage of right now, our resources and trainings. We put on webinars and in-person events throughout the entire year, ranging from various topics like mentor protege to maybe an elevator pitch and how you're going to develop that and kind of sell yourself to a webinar, making sure that your capability statement is the best that it can be. And so much more. We have guest speakers from government agencies come through. We have a ton of offerings. And the best part is that you can take advantage of and attend any of these trainings and webinars, whether or not you're in our service area. And you can also check out our website to find a ton of links and resources for a variety of contracting topics from getting your DBE certification to where do I have to go to get a GSA schedule again? <laughs> our website has those resources for you to explore on your own time, whether you are a client or not. So please do take advantage of that. But if you are looking to take advantage of all of these resources, please do apply for NorCal Apex Accelerator. If you are within our Northern Coastal Humboldt, um, California County, you can get connected with us and meet with your procure procurement specialist within a week. But if you're not within our service area, remember, it is a nationwide program. There is absolutely an Apex Accelerator Center near you who can offer this government contracting assistance. And again, you'll be getting the links to all of this within a week of this event, along with the recording. So you can go ahead and connect with your local Apex Accelerator from those links. And so with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Paul Tafernia. Oops. All right. Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Paul Tavernia. I've uh, been with the Apex Accelerator. Now it'll be exactly a year tomorrow, as a matter of fact. So uh, really, really enjoying it subsequent to retiring from the SBA at the end of 2021. But so today's webinar, what we're going to focus on is kind of give you an overview of the SBA's Mentor Protege Program. Uh, kind of what it's all about, um, you know, maybe a little bit about the the contents. Um, and then when I was thinking about putting together the um, the content for this particular session, I, you know, the, the mentor-protege agreement is one aspect of it, but it's really the, the joint venture that usually emanates from a mentor-protege agreement that is most relevant to the government contracting uh, participation. So, I wanted to make sure that we we touched on the, the joint venture aspects of the Mentor-Protege -Proge program as well. So SBA's Mentor-Protege program up until a number of years ago was pretty much confined solely to the 8A business development program. Um, and that was, and I will tell you, I mean, my, during my tenure at the SBA, um, I was involved with a lot of Mentor-Protege um, relationships, if you will. And it really could be a, a way to help a small fledgling 8A participant a kind of bootstrap and gain performance, self-performance capability and capacity by taking advantage of, you know, establishing a relationship typically with a larger, more experienced company. But then a number of years ago, uh, SBA expanded them, that out and created the all small mentor protege program. So you had the 8A MPP and then you had the all small MPP. Um, similar, except that there was a little bit difference, um, similar in concept and what they're trying to uh, um, accomplish, but kind of a difference in terms of oversight, review and approval of, the, you know, and that processes, those processes, I should say. And then uh, within the last few years, what the SBA decided to do was, okay, we're going to merge it all into a single program. So it's called the SBA Mentor Protege Program. It, it encapsulates both the 8A as well as the small business programs previously established. And uh, But we'll talk a little bit about review and approval uh, in a bit 
um, and how that um, how that differs depending upon the nature of the protege. So, so we're going to talk about the program. We're going to talk about the contents of the agreement, um, and then we'll talk about uh, joint ventures after that. So, so what is you know what's the kind of the rationale behind the SBA mentor protege program? Like I mentioned, it's typically. Uh, um, put in place or, or the entities will put it in place where a large prime contractor can provide assistance to a small um, contractor, you know, helping them, like I said, increase performance, self-performance capabilities and capacity and expand their opportunity areas, if you will, in terms of doing business with the federal government. Um, and it's just, you know, because doing working and doing business with the federal government is not for the faint of heart. It takes a tremendous amount of tenacity. And for small businesses trying to break into that arena, it can be a daunting task. And uh, but with the right focus and the you know the right tenacity, if you will, it can also be very lucrative. Um, but the the mentor protege program is just one of those extra support things available for small contractors as they try to increase or break into participating in the federal government contracting arena, okay? So it's a formal agreement between the mentor and the protege. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, and it's subject to SBA review and approval. So, um, you know, you go through the process of establishing the agreement um, and then, and we'll get into the contents of, of the agreement. And then you have to submit it to the SBA and the SBA um, headquarters folks um, had, do a review and they make sure that it passes muster, that it, you know, number one is um, conforming to all of the rules and regulations, but secondarily that it's the, the assistance that's uh, identified that the mentor is going to provide to the small business protege is consistent with the the small the, what the small business is trying to accomplish, okay? So, uh, we you know the SBA's charter is to make sure that there is, you know, it's it's copacetic, if you will, with what the with the small business is trying to trying to accomplish. So the mentor does not have to be a large business; it can be a small business. So it's not a prerequisite that it that it be a large business. However, I will tell you my experience in my experience that the, the mentors typically were large businesses, okay? The protege, con, uh, conversely, must be small according to the SBA size standards, okay? So, uh, and that's consistent with, you know, pretty much all of the other SBA programs. And um, so depending upon the protege's primary NAICS code, um, you can go in and I would, you know, you can Google NAICS, which is the NAICS codes, North American Industry Classification System. That is the industry classification system that the federal government uses. And you can see what the current size standard is, whether it's a revenue-based size standard, which is averaged over five years, average annual revenues, or whether it might be an employee-based size standard. So you'll want to know that um, as you go through, you know, initiate this process not only just with the mentor protege program, but doing business with the government and, and uh, in general, okay? Terms uh, for the mentor protege program and when they establish the one size fits all, if you will, um, it's initially a three year period and there's a three year extension available. So a mentor protege relationship can last up to six years, okay? And one of the things I wanted to, to mention is for a protege, they can only have, as the rigs are now, they can only have two mentors or mentor-protege agreements in their, uh, quote unquote, I'll say lifetime, okay? So it's not like um, you can have them forever um, because I think the intent there is that if you, go, if you go through a couple of six-year terms with the mentors, then you ought to be able to be pretty self-sufficient by the end of that, by the end of that time span. So Initial three-year period with a three-year extension and a two-year, a, a two-mentor uh, limitation, if you will, as well. But one of the things they said was, if you're a small business protege and you, you go through this process, you get it approved, 
And within the first 18 months, um, let's say it just it's not working out. You haven't had any contracts. Uh, it just it doesn't seem that, you know, to be the right fit uh, versus where you thought it was going to be. Then you can go ahead and you can cancel or terminate, if you will, that mentor protege agreement. And it will not count against the lifetime maximum of two. OK, so um, so you've got a year and a half to kind of check it out to make sure everything's squared away. And it, but if it's not, then you can go ahead and cancel, cancel or terminate that. And it won't count against your your two year total or two time total. OK. So contents of the mentor protege agreement. Essentially, it's, you know, if you've read legal documents, it's it's kind of a statement of purpose. It starts with. You know, whereas company A is a large business that specializes in whatever it is. And then whereas company B is a small business um, that does work in the following areas. Um, and whereas we decided we want to establish a, a mentor protege agreement and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the preliminary piece or the preliminary section, if you will to the mentor protege agreement. It kind of says, all right, we're the two parties identified in this MPA and this is kind of what we want to bring to the table. This is what, you know, because of this, because of that, you know, now therefore we want to establish a formal mentor protege agreement going forward. Okay, so you got all the whereas, 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 and then it's therefores, right? So, um, and there are mentor protege templates out there, I believe, that you can you can take a look at to kind of get an idea of what these declarations are. But they're pretty pretty straightforward. We here at the Apex can help you understand that. Um, if you have access to legal counsel, um, they've probably done these things before. If they if they've worked in the um, the federal contracting arena and whatnot, so so that's kind of the preliminary piece of the first part of the mentor protege agreement. Okay, but also within the body of the MPA, the the mentor has to explicitly state what it is they're going to bring to the table. Okay, it's not like we're just going to do good and avoid evil and be nice to this small business protege and help them along. No, it's much more um, defined than that. And I've I've listed there on the left hand side. The areas that we typically see where a mentor can provide assistance to the small business protege. Okay. So it's, you know, this is not all inclusive, but this is pretty much where we see, you know, by and large, the kind of assistance the mentor is going to bring. So management and technical assistance, that might be access to software or other programs that the mentor has within their infrastructure that they can you know, make available and teach, if you will, to the protege. And where I saw that in the SBA was a lot of, you know, here in Northern California, you might imagine that the federal contracting activity is somewhat construction centric. So if you think, you know, who are the main federal agencies by and large in Northern California, well, certainly the Corps of Engineers with thousands of miles of levees that they need to maintain, build and maintain. You've got the Bureau of Reclamation, you know, dams, rivers, and fish, the Forest Service, the Park Service, and even to a certain extent, GSA, with because they're the, the, the landlord, if you will, for federal buildings. So a lot of it was construction-centric. So in the mentor-protege context, what I saw was the mentors had scheduling software or proposal preparation software or um, a cost accounting software that they had developed over a number of years. And, you know, a small business protege or even, you know, potential protege typically doesn't have those kind of robust systems already developed and probably doesn't have the wherewithal or capacity to kind of build them out on their own, right? So, but aligning with a mentor and having the mentor provide that kind of education, that kind of training, um, really goes a long ways or has gone a long ways to help small businesses really understand 
the nuances of doing business with the federal government via, you know, like I said, programs and and software and that sort of thing. The mentor may have the uh, of the ability and the the, the affinity towards fi uh, providing financial assistance. Where we see that is in bonding capacity. Again, all every federal construction contract requires bonding, and small businesses. A lot of times when they're kind of get trying to get going, they are somewhat constrained in terms of their bonding capacity. Well, having a mentor uh, provide that kind of back bonding, if you will, um, and that that bond bonding support can really help a small business um, compete and actually participate um, for those kind of uh, construction contracts. But it may there may be other uh, aspects of financial assistance that the mentor can provide as well. Certainly, government contracting, and that's you know where the mentor typically has extensive federal government contracting experience, right? And so teaching the 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 protege on you know these are the compliance stuff that you need to be aware of that you have to you know you don't want to lose sight of because you don't want to put your, you know, the contract at risk, you don't want to put your business at risk. So providing that kind of in-depth expertise and be able to impart that to the to the small business is absolutely key um, because you don't want to fail. Um, one failure in the federal government contracting arena could be a, a black spot on your on your record that you you may or may not ever be able to recover from. So um, you know, having that that in-depth government contract experience and be able to articulate that to the small business is absolutely critical. And that's probably the area where we see most of the mentor protege um, activity uh, between the two entities. Business development, you know, uh, searching for opportunities, uh, maybe warm reference and introductions to agencies or departments that the, the mentor has done business with in the past to help, um, you know, provide you know, maybe some opportunities for the small business, even outside of the mentor protege context. Um, but, you know, being able to, you know, as as you probably garnered, if you've done, you know, any kind of public sector contracting, that that personal relationship, that one on one relationship is absolutely key to um, to helping you develop your your opportunities and your, you know, your your business development activities. So. You know, a mentor with a lot of experience in that can really help a small business trying to get started understand. All right, how do we how do we go and find opportunities? How do we reach out? Um, you know, and Amanda mentioned the capability statement um, as a prime vehicle as small businesses reach out and try try to establish those relationships with government entities. And it may be administrative support as well. You know, the back office accounting stuff, um, not just cost accounting, but, um, you know, could be maybe even tax implications um, and just operational assistance as well on running the day-to-day -day operations of the small business, um, kind of along the lines of the, way the, of the way the mentor is running there. So it can be very... Uh, um, comprehensive in terms of the the um, assistance that the mentor is going to provide to the protege. And so from the the the, con, the con, context to that is all right. So the, what does what does the protege have to do? Well, the protege on the front end has to based upon their business plan determine what it is they need. Where do they need support? Where do they need assistance? Where do they need help? Okay? And and what the SBA looks to is that the, the assistance that the men, the mentor is going to provide actually dovetails, if you will, with the protege's business plan. So the protege has identified, I need help with cost accounting, or I need help with uh, proposal generation, or I need help with scheduling or estimating or whatever the case may be. Well, what what the SBA wants to make sure is that the, the mentor's assistance matches in, uh, up with what the protege needs, okay? The protege is on the, the hook to um, checkpoint, if you will, with the SBA on an annual basis. 
the SBA is going to ask, uh, you know, how's it going? Do you want to continue with the relationship or not? Um, and if if they're if the relationship is uh, souring or if it's running into some some challenges, well, maybe the SBA can get involved to help kind of smooth that over or help, uh, you know, um, be the mediator, if you will, uh, prior to actually terminating the agreement and that sort of thing. So that's one of the things that the the mentor or the protege is going to be on the hook to do is to um, provide that kind of feedback to the SBA on an annual basis. And then the other thing is um, that the, the protege really needs to be aware of is the self-performance requirements. And we'll talk about that when we start talking about joint ventures. But it's, you know, what, what the SBA doesn't want is for this mentor-protege relationship to be a pass-through where the mentor is garnering all of the benefits and the protege isn't getting anything out of it, right? So a lot, you know, one of the things that the agencies and even the SBA keeps an eye on is making sure that the protege is self-performing um, on, on, on potential contracts or on contracts because that really becomes their vehicle, if you will, for growing their self-performance capabilities and capacities, okay? Oops. So in terms of the, the contents of the mentor protege agreement. So we've been talking about the assistance as the mentor is gonna to provide to the protege. Well, one of the things that the SBA is gonna look for in the contents of that mentor protege agreement is specific milestones. So it's what, what kind of assistance is the mentor gonna provide? Who from both the mentor side and the protege side are going to be the identified individuals. They're going to be responsible for working on this task or working on this aspect of the agreement. Okay. And it's, you know, name names and their titles. And how often are they going to meet? Okay. Um, and, you know, and then it's what are the expected outcomes based upon this, whether it's providing access to systems and software that, you know, we've got a couple of individuals that are going to meet on a weekly or a monthly basis. And at the end of six months, we expect that, you know, the, the protege will now have these systems in place and be up and running with those systems or whatever the case may be, or we're going to provide some bonding capacity, or we're going to provide some other sort of financial assistance. All right. Who's going to be responsible? And how often are they going to meet? And what do we expect is going to be a result of those, those conversations or those meetings and that sort of thing? So it's not nebulous. It's not, like I said before, it's not we're going to do good and avoid evil and, and do great things. It's no. It's what the SBA is going to want to see is very specific metrics on who, what, when, why, why, how, you know, that sort of thing. So Something to keep in mind that this need, you know, plan on having this articulated upfront in the body of the mentor protege agreement. Okay. Okay. Oops. Mouse is dancing all over the place. So if you're a prospective mentor, let's say you're a, a large prime uh, looking to maybe establish a, a relationship with a small business protege. Um, what I did here is I kind of cut and paste from a checklist that I used when I was at the SBA in terms of the documentation that the mentor should be uh, prepared to provide as, you know, when you submit your mentor protege agreement application and, and package, if you will, to the SBA, okay? So that second bullet says the protege's 8A profile. Um, it'll be the protege's profile, whether they're 8A or not. It's not 8A specific. Um, this one was taken actually from the, the 8A um, MPA uh, checklist that I used to use. So you want to see, you know, the, the mentor protege agreement, the protege's dynamic small business search profile. So their SBA profile. Um, you know, uh, 
if they've if they're in the 8a program their 8 a annual update but not necessarily so if they're not 8a um copy of the 8a business plan well the the protege ought to plan on submitting a copy of their business plan but not necessarily 8a specific um because that's where the SBA looks and says, all right, here's what the mentor is going to be providing. Oh, by the way, here's where the here's what the protege says they need. And they they kind of match those up. Um, and then some other um, uh, financial aspects and things that the, the mentor is going to provide. And you can see them there, uh, tax returns and that sort of thing, um, as well as financial statements, full year financial statements for three years. Um, and that's just to make sure that, you know, um, that they are who they say they are, that there aren't other subsidiaries. And if, uh, if there are, that they're clearly identified subsidiaries or affiliates, um, and really just to give the, um, uh, the SBA a, a, a real, um, good sense of what the prospective mentor is all about, um, you know, the mentor sam.gov profile. And then one of the other things is, in addition to the MPA, the mentor actually has to provide a letter, if you will, to the SBA on their letterhead saying, okay, you know, this is this is what we're going to do for our prospective protege. Okay, so they have to submit a narrative attesting to that fact. All right. So that everything's above, above board uh, and clearly identified and articulated to the SBA. Okay. So, so with that, um, I think we're at a, a good point where we're before we launch into joint ventures, uh, Amanda, why don't we see if we've got some questions and we'll go ahead and answer them. Absolutely. And we have some fantastic questions in the Q and a, um, thank you all so much for asking these questions. They're honestly great questions. Um, so for our first one, we had an anonymous attendee wondering what the difference is between the N the SBA mentor protege and like a mentor you would get from SBDC or like the counselors that we have at PTAC. Can you just redefine those distinguishers? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the mentors, if you will, that you get from other resource partners, whether it's Apex or SBDCs or whatnot, that's more of a one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> counseling type of situation. Whereas here in the mentor protege program, the formal programs, the mentor is a business, not necessarily an individual or a counselor. And the mentor is, you know, typically a government contractor. And the focus here is specifically on government contracting. Whereas with, you know, if you're talking with a quote unquote mentor with Apex or SCORE or the small business development centers and whatnot, you're talking to an individual and trying to get some some business um, business help, if you will, and not necessarily contracting focused. Whereas here, it's a it's a formal re relationship between businesses as opposed to individuals. Fantastic. Um, and then Keith was wondering if a mentor could be a nonprofit program, or do both the mentors and protégés have to be for-profit businesses? Um, the short answer, I think, is that the, the mentor probably has to be for-profit because the SBA's programs, by and large, are targeted for for-profit entities, okay? There might be an opportunity to put together a case where the nonprofit is a government contractor and um, you know uh, and wants to help a protege that's a for-profit business. Um, so I think there is the the possibility. I don't think it's prohibitive that um, the mentor cannot be a not a nonprofit entity. I think it's just got to be explained. Yeah, that makes total sense. It's possible but not exactly probable yeah we don't see it you know most of the time we see you know the mentor is a for-profit um, corporation or business yeah awesome and then Irwin with stay tech um was wondering how you can start developing these relationships between the mentors and protege how are you supposed to 
meet these mentors or possible mentors? That's a that's a great question because yeah, I'm I'm glad you you brought that up because one of the things that Apex and even the SBA, what we don't do is we don't provide mentors, right? We don't, uh, you know, we're not a match. We're not in the matchmaking business. The SBA is not in the matchmaking business, right? Um, so it's incumbent upon the the protege or the small business to try and find a mentor that they want to work with. And you're like, well, how do I do that? Well, it's all about figuring out ways to gain exposure to those mentors, to those large business or those prime contractors that are in your industry. And it's through going to conferences, whether virtual or face-to-face, -to, -face, um, to find out um, you know, which, which companies are doing business with that particular agency, whether it's some aspect of the DOD or the Department of Energy or Homeland Security or whoever it might be, right? Um, so look for matchmaking events, look for conferences, look for other outreach events where the, the, um, the potential mentors are going to be attending, if you will. Like I said, either in person or virtually. Um, but also, I mean, if, you, if you're a small business potential person, you're thinking, all right, this is the industry I'm in. Then you start thinking about, all right, who are the, in, in let's say in my close geography, who are the prime contractors doing business with the federal government that I think kind of align with what it is that I do, that I might be able to, um, you know, try to, to establish some sort of a relationship with and see if there is a possibility of maybe entering into a formal mentor-protege relationship. Um, look for bid, bid opening conferences or, um, you know, when the um where they're you know like a mandatory bid conference where anybody that wants to uh submit a prime uh, submit a bid as a prime for that particular project has to show up so if you're a small business show up and work the room introduce yourself and um you know have your elevator pitch at the ready so that as you you know running well, not running but walking around the room shaking hands uh, you can very clearly articulate who you are, what you do, ask them what they do, see if they're open to maybe the possibility of maybe some subcontract work to get started, which may in turn lead to a more formal relationship like a mentor-protege agreement to kind of, um, like I said, more formalize the assistance that that the, the prospective mentor might provide. Absolutely. And it was actually something um, we were asked if there is a list of possible mentors. And that was something Paul and I were discussing before this event. Um, I don't think we're aware of any lists of possible mentors. So those connections, those conferences, those meetings are really going to be your in. Absolutely. Fantastic. And then let's see. So many questions. You guys are fantastic. We love all of these questions. Um, so Rick was wondering, does the mentor and protege share in the contract revenue? Yes, they do. And we're going to talk about that because and that's a great, great lead in. I love you're a great straight man because the mentor, I, I, the way I characterize the mentor protege agreement that's a license to hunt, <laughs> okay? And the JV, the joint venture, that's the license to kill, if you will, not to be too graphic, but <laughs> that's 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 the license that's the license to close, if you will, right? So um, there is there absolutely is cost sharing, and we will talk about that. Um, as um, yes, fantastic. And we can go ahead. We do still have a ton of questions, but I see some that I can type up answers to really quickly. Okay. So if you want to go ahead and finish up the presentation, I'll be putting answers to the questions that I can in the Q&A. All right. Well, let's, oh, we got about 20 minutes. We're in good shape. All right. So let's continue and take it the next step further. So once 
like I said, once the mentor protege agreement is in place, it's formally blessed and approved by the SBA. That's your license to hunt. That says, okay, now, now we can we as a team, if you will, as two entities, we can come together and create a joint venture. And the joint venture becomes an entity of itself. The mentor protege agreement does not create an entity. It creates a relationship. The joint venture creates an entity. And that entity is what is eligible to receive a government contract. Okay? So the joint venture, um, according to the regs, the you know, it's it's owned by both the mentor and the protege. The protege has to own, if you will, at least 51% of the joint venture. Okay. So um and also within the joint venture, you have to the previous question, the 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 cost sharing or the revenue sharing percentages explicitly stated in the the contents of the joint venture. Okay. So it's you know, if we make if we make a dollar in profits, how is it going to get split? Right. And it doesn't have to necessarily mirror the ownership percentage. I think by and large, you'll see that it does, but it doesn't have to. So the ownership percentage is one thing and the revenue sharing is another aspect of it. Okay. But it's got to be mutually agreed to by both parties. So everybody goes into it with their with their eyes open, all right? But the joint venture has to be majority owned by the protege. So what's included in the joint venture? Well, like I like it says there, the reg the 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 regulations and it's the the code of federal re regulations CFR. So it's third. I'm, I'm going to get this. I think it's I think it's on the next slide, but I'll preview it. Um, 13 CFR 125.8, to be specific, um, will outline the, all of the specific line items to the line item detail, what needs to be included in the joint venture agreement, okay? And it's, you know, who's it's the ownership, it's the revenue, it's what resources, it's, you know, the termination, it's uh, documentation, um, all that sort of thing. And there's a laundry list of about 13, 14 different items. Um, and so it's all it's all right out there in in black and white for you to to kind of make sure that you know T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and that the the joint venture agreement conforms to what's spelled out in the regulations. Okay? Pretty straightforward, not rocket science. But you want to make sure that everything is covered. Okay. And I will, I'll just kind of preview one of the things that, one of the aspects that you want to kind of keep in mind. They talk about resources. Who's bringing what to the table, whether it's people or whether it's equipment or uh, materials or whatever the case may be. But one of the one of the line items within the joint venture agreement is resources. Who's bringing what to the table? And you want to make sure that, to the greatest extent possible, that's that's defined. Um, and where we used to see it in the eight A uh, was a lot of times they would do kind of an open ended joint venture agreement um, as a result of a mentor protege uh, a relationship that they had established. And I remember it was a number of years ago where the SBA um, was reviewing a joint venture agreement and they did not approve it because there wasn't sufficient specific, specifics, if you will, on what it was, the, the, the resources that the mentor was going to provide versus the resources that the protege was going to provide. And the SBA said, no, you need to define that. So that's just something to, to keep in mind, okay? And the other thing is, within the federal regulations, there's rules of affiliation. So if an entity 
or multiple entities have common management and common ownership, then by and large, they're deemed to be affiliates. And if it's the revenue size standard, then the revenues of both get added together to see how it tracks against the size standard. Well, what the mentor-protege agreement enables is that when the mentor and the protege come together and create a joint venture, they're able to skirt, if you will, the rules of affiliation. So that joint venture will look small, okay? Even though the, the mentor may be a, a large, you know, multi-billion dollar business, that particular joint venture looks small because they've got the, the mentor-protege umbrella agreement in place uh, formally reviewed and approved by the SBA. The other thing about the joint venture to keep in mind is the joint venture takes the flavor, if you will, of the protege. So if the, the protege is an 8A firm, then the joint venture looks like a small 8A firm. Similar, if the protege is a hub zone approved certified business, then that joint venture looks like a hub zone or woman owned or service disabled veteran owned, depending upon the, the, the ownership or the, you know, what certifications the protege has. So the joint venture takes on a flavor of the, the protege and is able to participate in those kind of set aside opportunities. Okay. So, but one of the things to keep in mind is self-performance because there are some pretty clearly defined um, self-performance thresholds. So as I mentioned before, the joint venture is the entity that's awarded the contract. So the joint venture is on the hook to self-perform on that contract, depending upon what kind of a contract it is. If the joint, if it's a services contract, then the joint venture has to self-perform at least 51%. If it's a, uh, let's say it's a specialty construction, specialty contractor construction, then the joint venture has to self-perform at least 25%. And we're talking about the labor content of the, of the contract. We're not talking about materials and equipment. This is labor content. This is people, personnel, okay? If it's a general construction contract, then the joint venture has to self-perform 15% or is it 10%, maybe 10%, right? Has to be performed by the joint venture. So we're not looking at pass-throughs. We're not looking at a joint venture being awarded a contract and then having somebody else, some other subcontractor do all the work. Nope, not going to fly, right? So, you know, just keep in mind that self-performance thresholds are there. So the joint venture itself has to perform, has to self-perform based upon the type of contractor, general construction, specialty construction services. Within that, within that joint venture self-performance, the protege also has a self-performance threshold that they have to meet. And that threshold is 40%. So of the labor portion of the contract, that the joint venture is going to um, uh, take care of, or um, uh, yeah, then the protege has to self-perform at least 40% of that, okay? And that's in its labor only. So the whole intent there is that we can track that the, pro the, the protege is actually doing some of the work. And when I say we, that's kind of the SBA, but also, the federal agencies now, because, you know, if you're a joint venture, um, you know, going after a contract, the, the agency is going to ask for a copy of the JVA, the joint venture agreement. And they're, they're going to want to make sure that the self-performance thresholds for the protege are explicitly articulated in the JVA. So the joint, the protege is on the hook to self-perform at least 40% of the work that the joint venture does. So the joint venture doesn't have to do 100% of the work. They can do 40% or 60% or 80, whatever the case may be. 
but the protege has to subperform at least 40% of that, of that content. Okay. Approvals. Well, in the past, in the 8A world, every 8A joint venture had to be formally approved, reviewed and approved by the SBA. And every addendum to that joint venture um, had, had to be reviewed and approved by the SBA. Well, what they've done is they've really um, reduced, if you will, the amount of SBA approvals that are required. So outside of the 8A, if it's a hub zone mentor protege, or if it's a hub zone, woman owned, service disabled, or just small business joint venture agreement, the SBA doesn't have to do any reviews and approvals of the JVA once they've approved the mentor protege agreement. Okay. If the mentor protege agreement is an 8A based MPA, then the only time that the SBA has to uh, review and approve a joint venture agreement is when it's for an 8A sole source contract. If that joint venture is pursuing a, an 8A competitive set aside, the SBA does not have to review and approve that joint venture agreement. Okay. So, so that's 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 one of the big changes recently is that the SBA only approves uh, um, sole source um, 8A joint venture agreements. All right, but you want to make sure that you know if you're not a part of the 8A program and you're putting together a joint venture agreement that it absolutely conforms to all of the requirements and the regulations because um, that's what the government agency is going to want to look at. They're going to say, all right. We want to see a copy of your mentor protege agreement. We want to see a copy of your joint venture agreement. And we're going to make sure that it, it it's conforming before we think about awarding a contract to the JV. Okay. So here's some regulations um, to keep in mind. Oh, we got a little over five minutes. So like I said, 13 CFR 125.8, that's where it gives you all of the, the, the wherewithal and all of the the specific contents of the joint venture agreement. And then you can see for different subset set-asides, there's other um, regulations that, that drill down into a little bit more detail than that. Okay, so, but the, the net message there is make sure you're in conformance going into it and then you got nothing to worry about. Whoops. And with that, I think that's all I got. Amanda, so if we want to do some more questions and then we'll kind of wrap things up here. Absolutely. And we have a ton of questions. We aren't going to be able to get to everybody's, but please do reach out to your local Apex Accelerator to get these questions answered and to get no-cost government contracting assistance. Who can go wrong there? Prepaid with your tax dollars. Exactly. <laughs> the, the main thing we really want you guys to take away is not just NorCal Apex, but Apex Accelerator Centers are here to help you succeed at no cost. So you're really not losing anything by getting connected with your local one, whether that's Northern California's uh, Apex Accelerator or the local one to wherever you are. And if you guys are looking for some more training opportunities, we have a ton this month. We're doing about two every week. So if you are looking for an introduction to government contracting, we have our introductory webinar this Thursday, which is always a good foundation to have. But we also have some really fantastic um, events for the rest of the month, including a Department of Defense mentor protege overview, which would be a fantastic compliment. Um, and I will go ahead and drop the link to all of our trainings in the chat so you guys can all go find those out as we are answering the last bit of our questions. And um, the DOD mentor protege program is, is substantially different than the SBA's MPP. So um, if you're interested in doing business with the DOD or getting going down that path, um, I would encourage you to sit in on Mary Jo's webinar later on this month because uh, like I said, they're they're separate and distinct um, not in their in their content and their execution. Let's put it that way. 
absolutely. You need to get all those details to make sure you're following that compliance and doing what you need to. Yep. All right, so on to our questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, okay. Michelle's wondering how many protégés can a large business have at one time? Typically, I think the number is three. But what the SBA is going to look at is do they over do they cross over industry wise, and that and SBA is going to take a pretty jaundiced look, if you will, if there's two potential protégés that are kind of in the same in. Um, industry, SBA is probably not going to approve it because they don't want they don't want the, any potential possibility of the mentor maybe playing both sides against the middle, if you will. Yeah. So a mentor can have three protégés, but they're probably going to have to be in separate and distinct types of businesses and industries, NAICS, codes, that sort of thing. Absolutely. And then we had a question about capability statements for mentor protégé. Would you recommend making your capability statement as targeted to the mentor as possible or leaving it more broad and more generalized so they can see the breadth of the kind of work the protege would do? I think if you're talking to a, a potential mentor, your capability statement should really kind of reflect the company itself and its breadth of experience and, and capabilities and that sort of thing. Doesn't Not necessarily catered to a specific mentor, if you will. Uh, but more, you know, lead with your your normal capability statement. This is who we are. This is what we do. This is what we're really good at. And then use that as the basis for furthering the conversation. Perfect. And then Marvin was wondering, um, should they try to become a mentor or protege if they are planning to get a, a certified? Um. It depends upon, you know, as you as you go through and figure out um, which agencies you want to do business with, right? And you can find out whether or not they, they have an affinity towards the 8A program or not. Um, certainly, if you, you don't have to wait to get 8A certified to go, if you've got a prospective mentor and it looks like you're, you're going down the path of wanting to establish a relationship, I say go for it. Go ahead and get the mentor protege agreement in place. Even if you're not 8A, once you, you know, if if during the course of that that relationship, you do get your 8A certification, then no problem. You can always just then put together a, if you will, maybe a, um, a new joint venture agreement, even though the MP, the mentor protege relationship stays in place. Maybe put in a, a, a subsequent joint venture agreement that reflects the 8A status. And then you can use that to go after 8A opportunities. Perfect. And then just two more. I know we are at time. And as a friendly reminder for everybody, you will get the recording and slides within a week of this event. So if you do have to hop off, please feel free to do so. Um, you'll still be able to check out the answer to these next two questions when you get that recording. Okay. Um, so Carissa was wondering, why would a prime want to be a mentor? She saw that there are incentives provided by SBA, but she's not really sure her business would benefit. Well, I will tell you, yeah, that's a great question because there's a it, the mentor protege relationship has a couple of different aspects. One, it gives the opportunity for a mentor to help a small, typically fledgling small business increase their capacity, maybe become a a, a go-to subcontractor, if you will, for that mentor, but also give them the protege capacity to evolve into a prime if they're not there already, right? But the other thing is, you know, mentors are not necessarily altruistic. What the, what the mentor-protege agreement and relationship allows is typically a large, large business mentor to play in the small business space. So what it allows the mentor to do is participate and, and have contracting opportunities, if you will, in small business in the small business arena where they normally would not be able to play because they're too big. So that's part of the, you know, that's that's another one of the carrots, if you will, for the mentor is 
they it maybe expand them expand their business opportunities in into the the small business space absolutely very important things to consider from both perspectives mentor and protege absolutely um and then we had someone asking how and where do set asides come in if a prime needs VOSB to meet their quota for a contract could a men, uh, could a protege step in or would that be like a separate kind of agreement um it it probably could work both ways maybe during the course of if you had a joint venture in place um maybe utilizing that joint venture for part of that contract to be able to show VOSB or SDVOSB participation. Okay. Um, and then, um, but on the other hand, um, it would also allow, let's say the protege was a service disabled veteran owned business, then a joint venture, they could go after an SDVOSB set aside and be there. Um, and if it was within the VA, that joint venture would be eligible for a sole source contract to the service disabled veteran owned business or joint venture. Because like I said, the JV takes on the flavor of the protege and the VA can do sole source contracts to service disabled veteran owned small businesses. So um, yeah, there's, there's different ways depending upon the, the requirement, the agency, what kind of a contract it is, you know, the size, the breadth, that sort of thing, um, where, you know, the mentor-protege relationship and maybe even a subsequent um, joint venture would um, provide um, the, the wherewithal for the agency to actually take credit and check the box for, in this case, veteran or service-disabled veteran-owned participation. Yeah, wow. That's awesome. Um. Okay, and this will be the last question. I don't want to keep anybody too long, um, hey, but I, I really- all, I got all day, it doesn't matter <laughs> to me. <laughs> I really like this question. Um, they're asking if a joint venture is formed between the mentor protege, is it subject to that six year limit that the mentor protege is subject to as well? Actually, there is a, no, it's the, the rules for the joint ventures are different. They're a little bit more restrictive in that it used to be that there was the three and two rule. The joint venture could be awarded three contracts in a two year period of time. Mm -hmm. Now I think they've, they've changed that so that they don't have a real time constraint. I think there might be so, some guidelines in terms of the number of contracts that the joint venture can be awarded. And it really, it really relates to, and this is, you know, when, when the protege talks to their SBA rep on an annual basis, what the SBA is going to find out is, or is going to want to know is how many contracts were you awarded? How many contracts was the joint venture awarded? And what they're going to be looking for is, all right, is there an over-dependency on the part of the protege for joint venture work with a mentor such that they're not really gaining ground, capacity, performance capabilities, that kind of thing, or not. Um, but the other thing is the, the purpose of a joint venture typically is not open-ended. It usually is formed to go after a specific opportunity. But that's not to say that you can't um, form a, more of an open-ended joint venture, which is absolutely within the regulations acceptable. And we see it a lot as well. Um, cool. But what they're going to want to see is, you know, all right, you know, if a joint venture has been in place and they're not seeing any action, uh, you know, what's going on? They're going to ask questions as to, you know, why'd you put this thing in place in, in the first place or not? Or, um, well, the other thing is if, if it's an open-ended joint venture, then every time you, you are going to go bid on a contract specific opportunity requirement, you would have to, you have to put in an, an addendum in place doesn't get reviewed by the SBA um but you have it on you have it in the records or in the file if you will where they said all right here's an addendum that says we agree we're going to go after this specific opportunity okay um but by and large what we see is a joint venture is put in place initially 
targeting a specific opportunity so that it's not, you know, open-ended as like a 20-year joint venture type thing, right? It's mm -hmm. more project specific. But you've got the opportunity to, let's say, put in a joint venture, we're targeting a specific project, we win that. Well, we want to use that same joint venture to go after maybe a couple more contracts as well. Then you just you write up a one-page addendum, both parties sign it. You're identifying that we agree we're going to go after this thing and then see what happens. Okay, but it, it doesn't have the same kind of time limits that the MPA has. Fantastic. Um, and so with that, we do have one more question, which I kind of want to leave us on. Um, but before we do that, I want to let everybody know, thank you all so much for joining us. I know we went a little over. I'm so glad you guys could stay. Um, you. You'll, of course, be getting the recording and slides. And if you do have a moment, you'll be redirected to our feedback survey. We love to hear about how you thought the webinar went, what you think of the content, and we use that feedback to make our trainings even better for you. So your feedback is invaluable. Yeah, tell and, us what you thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Paul, for a great presentation. I'm so excited that we were able to get this one out. My pleasure. So if you'd like to go ahead and leave our audience with your best tips for how to find a mentor. Like I said, I think it's, you know, finding finding opportunities where you're going to be able to engage in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Okay. Um, and just, if you're a small business, kind of test the waters, just, you know, ask them, ask the question, are you open to, you know, talking about a potential mentor protege relationship? Are you looking to maybe, um, you know, are you looking for proteges or potential proteges? And if the answer is yes, you say, okay, let's talk a little bit about it. You know, and and the th one thing, you know, I saw some mentor-protege relationships that went sour. You know, it's not all rainbows and butterflies, right? So it's go into it with your eyes. If you're a small business, go into it with your eyes open. Same thing. If you're uh, maybe a large prime, go into it with your eyes open. Make sure that you know, love, and trust each other going into it because, you know, it's like a marriage, right? Um, if you're going to do it right, um, you know, do the due diligence. Make sure that the 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 way the op the mentor operates is copacetic with the way the protege operates, and you're mutually aligned, you know, philosophically on how you want to get work done and how you want to do business with the with the government and that sort of thing. Um, because, you know, I I I will tell you, I saw where. All it took is one project where the mentor and the protege were working together or they won a, won a contract and it became a, very apparent very fast that they were not on the same page in terms of how they how they philosophically wanted to go about executing or, or performing the requirements of the contract. And so, um, and that was their, they were essentially one and done, right? So take the time, to make sure that you are you, whether you're a potential mentor or protege, you are on the same page with the other party um, before you, uh, like I said, submit to submit to formal application because of the, you know, the 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 limitations in terms of the number of mentor, mentors or protege you can have. Absolutely. And thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, Paul, for those final thoughts. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Reach out to your Apex Accelerators. That's why we're here. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Take care, everyone. <laughs>